What advice would you give to your younger self? You ever thought about that? You ever thought if you could go back in time and meet your younger self or send a letter back, what is it would you say? There are certainly things I would tell myself now knowing what I know, but I really wonder if my younger self would receive it. Because I think if I had been wise enough to receive it then, I might have been wise enough to come up with it then. I, I'm not entirely sure. They say you can't put old heads on young shoulders. And so I think there's some truth to that. But I am thankful for people that have tried because of life, because of what they've known from the Bible, their own experiences. They've tried to help me out of the things that they had experienced, and they've, they've entrusted things to me. I remember uh, especially older men trying to take me aside and speaking with me about things that they wanted me to know. And hopefully you've had some of that in your life, whether it was a father or a grandfather or a pastor or an uncle or maybe a Sunday school teacher. Uh, and then I've had, I've had ladies look in on me many, many times as a young man, especially when I was away from home. There would be a number of the ladies from the church uh, that would, uh, older women that would make sure that I was taking care of myself and I was doing what I ought to be doing. And if I was sick, then they made sure that I was resting and all of those things. And so we've been invested in by people. And it's a great thing that we've been invested in by people. And as we come to this time in the book of Acts, Paul is speaking with some that he is greatly invested in over the last three years. And he has this hard moment when he has to give them over to God. He's leaving. He's not going to be able to help them anymore. And when problems come up and bad teaching comes up and some guy comes through teaching bad doctrine again, he's not going to be there to come back through another time and help them out with it. And so it's grieving in his heart that this is going on. It's a sad time, but also a precious time. And one of the topics is about what will make you quit. What would make you quit on what it is that God has given you to do? You say, and the right answer, especially because we're in church, is nothing. I would never quit on the things that God has given me to do. But what if it costs you your freedom and you ended up having to serve jail time because of it? What if it cost you your safety or your health because you'd be mistreated because of it? What if it caused you to be separated from your loved ones for a period of time, maybe forever, or for them to be separated from you? What if it would ruin your good name in society? And of course, we all just say, even though all of those things happen, I would not be moved. But words are one thing and actions are another thing. And some of us, I don't know that we'll know until we are in that position, but hopefully we've walked with the Lord close enough where the things that we say will be the things that we do. Paul calls a pastor's conference with his friends from the city of Ephesus, and he pours out his last words to them before leaving them forever. And we see in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 13, the beginning of this passage, the word of God says, And we went before to ship and sailed to Asos, there intending to take in Paul, for so he had appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he had met us at Asos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogilium. And the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy." and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that as it's powerful, as it's quick, as it's living, I pray you'd use it so in our hearts tonight. 
pray that you would move among us and have free course. Help us to be here and present and now without the distractions. I pray that you give me clarity of thought and speech, power from on high. Use me tonight to bless your people. And I pray that you would be glorified through it. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul is wrapping up his third missionary journey. He was sent out of the church in Antioch near the Bible lands. And as he would go out, he would go city to city, telling the good news of Jesus Christ. He'd see people saved and baptized and organized together in loose churches. And then he would move on from that city and he would do that in many places. Sometimes he'd move on of his own accord. Oftentimes he'd get run out of town in trouble. But he would go back after the end of a journey of, of perhaps many months, even years, as we see. And he went through one journey, traveling abroad and telling even Gentiles about the good news of Jesus Christ. And then he went again on a second journey and came back. And he's been on a third journey. And he's been in the city of Ephesus for a long time now. And he's heading through other parts of that world into Macedonia and other places. And now he is coming towards the end of this. He's coming towards the end of this thing as he's heading back to Jerusalem. And he knows that something is going to happen. He is well aware because of what the Spirit is telling him that things are about to change. And so he calls this meeting that we read about. So let's begin in verse number 13 as we follow along with what Paul, this great Bible teacher and preacher and wonderful witness, is going to say to these folks that he dearly loves. Verse 13 says, And we went before to ship and sailed to Asos, there intending to take in Paul, for so he had appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Asos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. You say, I don't know any of those things, right? Those names of those places are all unfamiliar to me. The only thing that's noteworthy in this that I think would jump out to us, well, two things. One, the Bible is true. These are real places. When they wanted to get somewhere, they traveled from city to city. We know that the Spirit of God is the author of what we read, but there are human penmen that are involved in it, and they intended for this to be a historical record and to be accurate. And Paul has, has a Luke, who's writing this for him, and he says, we there, so Luke is on this ship that's traveling. And what's interesting is Paul sends everybody on the ship around this coast to meet him on the other side, and he cuts across land on foot. You ever just wanted to get away? The Lord Jesus got away. There would be times when there would be crowds and crowds of people and more people to do miracles for and more people to preach to. And yet even though the need was great and the outside, the need was also great on the inside. And so he went away to be with the Father. And he would, re he would remove himself from that public life. When his disciples were sent out two by two and they'd seen devils cast out in the name of Jesus and people healed and lots of people coming to faith and they came back rejoicing at what God had done through them, Jesus says, let's come apart. Let's get away. You've had quite the trip. And so Paul, perhaps knowing what's about to happen, gets by himself and he walks rather than taking the boat with everyone else and he meets up with them again afterward. Verse 15 and we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogilium, and the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend time in Asia. So he was not going to stop at Ephesus, though the boat could have taken him there. He didn't want to get stuck visiting with everybody. How many of you have a family where when you start to leave a family function, it becomes a half an hour process? How many of you have that family? We have, especially on the Greek side of the family, you're trying to say goodbye for 30 minutes. You're saying goodbye to everybody, and then they stop and talk with you, and then you're moving all the way through. Have you hugged and kissed all the ants, and have you, have you shooken all the hands with the... I mean, it, it takes a while. He knew what would happen if he went back to Ephesus. He had been there for so long and had so many dear friends and enemies, and he said, I have a hope, in verse 16, I have a hope that I'm going to make it in time to be at Jerusalem for the feast day of Pentecost. There would be a lot of unbelieving Jewish people that would come to Jerusalem during that feast day that Paul was perhaps hoping that he could witness to. He knew that some of his friends would be gathered back together from abroad celebrating that feast day, and he wanted to be there to observe it. And so he wasn't going to spend the time in Asia uh, if it were possible for him to get there. And so in verse 17, it says, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. He gets the leaders that are in that church in Ephesus. All of the different people that are preaching and teaching, the pastors, the overseers, the bishop, we find these words being used interchangeably depending on the roles that they're being described for. And so he calls them to a city that's a little ways away because he wanted to speak with them one last time before he left this part of the world. And when they were come to him in verse 18, he said to them, "'Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons.'" 
He's reminding them about their time together. He says, you've seen me at my best and you've seen me at my worst. He says, all seasons you've known when I've been among you. And you know what my manner is. You know what my behavior is. You don't just know me from hearing about me. You know me from seeing me. You understand who I am because I've lived my life among you and you've paid attention. And that doesn't mean that Paul was perfect and that he had left some kind of perfect example. But he was someone who knew the Lord, walked with the Lord, glorified God, preached the word. And as we'll see here, he reminds them of the things that he did in their midst. It's a reminder to us that people are watching what manner of life we have at all seasons. Now, we don't always see each other at all seasons, right? It's easy for us to put on our best faces when we're out and about. We come to church, we put on the very best version of us. But it's also something else behind the scenes. But unless you happen to live by yourself, people are watching at all times, in all seasons. And they're seeing how real it is, the faith that we say that we live. And Paul was able to, by God's grace, say, you know what I was like through all of these things. He says, serving, verse 19, the Lord with all humility of mind. What was he about? He was serving lots of people, preaching to lots of people, doing miracles and seeing lots of things done, but all of it would be encapsulating that he was serving the Lord. He was serving the Lord. You know, he belonged to God. He was God's man. He was called by God. That's what he was given to do. And though he was called to serve those people in the name of the Lord, he knew who it was that was his master. And he said he did so with humility of mind. He did so humbly. You see, he's about to warn them of people that are going to come in and cause trouble. When he's gone, and it seems like there's a power vacuum, someone will stand up trying to be the next latest, greatest, best thing. They're going to try and draw people away to themselves and make their own little teachings. And well, I, I know what Paul said, but I've heard some things myself and you need to know what I know. And they wanted to make a name for themselves. And he's like, you're gonna have to watch out for that. But remember my example and I want you to follow that. Don't try and make yourself more. Try and make God more. He said, you know my humility of mind. And with tears and temptations, that's not triumphant sounding, is it? He says, when the Jews were lying in wait for me, the non-believing Jewish community that were trying to destroy Paul, they would plot and scheme against him, trying to either get him arrested or to get him stoned to death in mob justice. They were after him. They chased him out of a lot of cities. They caused him all sorts of trouble in Ephesus as well. After things went on for a while, there was a large uproar. Well, he says, you know that I was crying during those seasons. Maybe he was fearful. Maybe he was grieved that he had poured his heart out and this was the response that he got because he was rejected. We're not told all of the reasons that he cried those tears, but it was because of the, the schemes that laid in wait. Have you ever felt like you were trying to do the right thing, but bad stuff just kept happening anyway? You try and help somebody, you try and help somebody, and you just work and work and work, and, and still they treat you in such a way that, that hurts. If you've ever been in that place, I think that's where Paul was when he talks about these tears. Temptations, temptations to handle it the wrong way. Temptations to handle it instead of with grace and with mercy to come in there with force and with anger and with the flesh To perhaps even quit a temptation that could have come upon him though. We'll see he is unmoved In verse 20 and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you But have showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house He says I told you everything that I knew to tell you about God he said, that was my mission. That's what I was doing. And whether I was preaching publicly in the school of Tyrannus or in the synagogue until they kicked us out of it, or whether I was in your homes teaching in, in smaller groups and maybe even discipling some of you men one-on-one, -on -one, he says, I was open to teach you all of these things. I didn't hold anything back from you. Testifying, verse 21, both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, what I was teaching to you and to them was turning away from your sin to God and placing your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. That was always his message. And whether it was to the Jewish people that were expecting a Messiah or to the Greeks that didn't even know that there was a Messiah, but were looking for a true God as opposed to their capricious false gods, he preached to everyone. He says in verse 22, and now behold, I go bound and chained almost as we'll see this word later on, bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that befall me there. This is the reason I've called you together. The reason I've called you together is I'm on my way to Jerusalem 
And it probably will not turn out great. But here's what I can tell you. The Spirit of God is so forcefully leading me in this direction that I know I must go. I must go. I am, I am bound. I want you to think for a second about how people would move those that were in shackles in times gone by, the fetters around their hands and their hands chained together, and they would be dragged along behind a cart, whether they were prisoners of war in some ancient land being dragged to the new home where they would be serving. They'd be dragged along by these chains. That's the idea here. Paul says it's an inevitable thing that if I'm going to follow God, if I'm going to follow the Spirit, I'm going to end up going back to Jerusalem. And I really don't know how it's going to play out. He may have some guesses, but he, he believes that from this point, he's back to Jerusalem and then to Rome. We continue reading in verse number 23, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. He says, everywhere that I've been, I've wound up dealing with imprisonment and I've wound up dealing with suffering, with affliction. And the Holy Ghost has not told me that that's about to stop, but that that is going to be a hallmark of the things that I'm going to be involved in. And he says, I know that that's what life has been before, and it's probably going to continue to be. And in verse 24, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself. He says, even though I know I'm going, and I know there will be trouble, and I very well could end up dead at the hands of a mob, or I could very well end up in prison, or I could very end up beaten and afflicted, that he is not moved from his course because he is bound in the spirit to go. He knows where God is leading him. He knows what God wants him to do. And just because there are obstacles and that there will be a price to pay and consequences for following through with what it is that he believed God wants him to do, it doesn't mean that he's going to quit. We were, we were taught in the programming world that there was this thing called the least cost path that you were always looking for when you were writing software. It was the simplest way to get something done. The thing that had the least obstacle to it. And you always wanted to try and optimize everything when you were doing that. That mindset has also come into our world. Our world is always trying to find the least cost path, meaning the path with the least cost, the thing that it will be the easiest. Keep your head down. Don't stand up for anything too boldly. Don't speak out too loudly. Just, just keep yourself quiet and you'll have less problems. Keep your head down. Do what you're supposed to do. Clock in, clock out. Be quiet. You'll be fine. Paul was not given that option because of what he had been called to do. He could not just keep quiet. He could not just keep his head down. He said, I must go, and though I'm going to face opposition, none of those things will move him away from the course that he's on, whether they're hard or whether they're easy. Now, you and I, unless God calls us to a very certain place around the world, are probably not going to be in a situation like this where we are worried about the imprisonment for the exercise of preaching the gospel. It could happen one day, even in our own country, but as of right now, I don't think we're going to face that in the near future. Unless the Lord returns and then things will turn very quickly. I don't know that we'll end up having to worry about being beaten for our faith, though there are places around the world where that happens. But if you're going to be what God has called you to be, there's going to be a cost to it. There's going to be a price. Everything is about trade-offs. Anyone that tells you that you can have everything is lying to you. You can't have everything. You can't be everything. You can't have all the options. In fact, we have just a few things that we can control and just a few things that we can do and that we can do well and that we ought to do well. If God has called you into a family, then you have a family responsibility. You have a role in that family. Maybe you're a husband. Maybe you're a wife. Maybe you're a mother, maybe you're a father, maybe you're a son, maybe you're a daughter. Maybe you're a grandson or a granddaughter, maybe you're a grandparent. Those roles and responsibilities are something that God has brought into your life and that you and I need to fulfill those roles, even if it doesn't look easy. If you've been married for any length of time, everybody has come upon moments when they think, this thing is hopeless. Everybody has had those moments at some point or another where they're like, this is a mess. I know some people that, that just want to run. They just want to run away from it. But because of the promise that they made before God and knowing that God had led them into it, they will continue on forward even with the heartache and even with the challenge. 
Sometimes these things, these things change. You know, we think about caring for our children and the heartache that comes sometimes with that when we see our children making decisions, destructive decisions, where they're hurting themselves, and that's a hard thing to watch. It's, it's probably one of the most grievous things that I can imagine. And you look at that and you think, well, am I just going to give up on my kids and abandon and stop praying and stop trying to influence and stop trying to encourage? Or am I going to continue on with what the Lord has given me to do, even if it's hard, even if there's conflict, even if it's ugly? Because the world says anybody that gets in your way, that ruins your vibes, you need to cut them out. They're toxic, right? But if God has called us to this, we can't let any of these things move us. Maybe God has put something in your heart to do for him. And any work done for the Lord is going to experience opposition of the enemy. He is not going to allow it to move forward. And certainly not going to allow it to move forward without a fight. And so there's going to be a fight. But that doesn't mean we ought to back down just because there is a fight. He says, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself. Now, the natural understanding of this is, I'm not going to move, and even if it takes my life and I have to die for the cause of Christ, I'm willing to do it. How many of you see that here in this passage? It's there, by the way. But you know what's also there? He's not just saying that I'll die for Christ. He's saying I'm willing to give up my, all the way to my life and everything before it. His comfort, his freedom, his respectability, his reputation, his plans, his perhaps dreams of what he hopes is going. He is willing to give up those things. The things that he has that some might refer to as his, he had already long ago given those up to God. And so though the obstacles are not going to dissuade him from where he's going, he also realizes that any price that he pays is worth paying. Why? What is it that he is so passionate about accomplishing? He says this, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He says, I've been given a course. I've been given a mission to complete. And I've been given a place of service to finish up. And I want to finish those things and finish those things with joy because I have purpose in glorifying God and specifically testifying to the gospel, the grace of God. There are a lot of people that are alive but don't really live for anything. There are a lot of people that are alive, but they don't really live for anything. They don't have any purpose to their lives. They just survive. They just go from one day to another, just bouncing along down the road like some can that has been kicked, listless, with no thought of accomplishing anything. Paul knew what he was about. He knew what his life was about. He knew why he was giving his life and actually would give his life, spoiler alert, in the future. He said it's worth it for this mission because he says the joy that I get from obedience to God and fulfilling the mission that he's given to me would be greater than anything else, even to the cost of his own life. That is a world away from how people think today, isn't it? Stay alive and as youthful as long as you can. Enjoy everything as long as you can. Get as much stuff as you can. Go on as nice trips as you can. And, all, and I'm not saying that those things are all bad, but that is the mindset of the world is to just get and consume, to just be a consumer. By the way, the producers have turned us into consumers. They want us just sitting there, sucking down stuff off of the internet, entertainment-wise, just purchasing and spending and working a little bit to get more money to buy the stuff that they want to make merchandise. They don't want us to have a grand purpose, but we desperately need one. And Paul says, I want to finish this ministry that I've received because I didn't just get this from my own imagination. The Lord Jesus Christ gave me this ministry. What ministry? To testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And it's not unique to the Apostle Paul. All of us that know Christ as Savior have been called to be his ambassadors, as we heard about on Sunday, and to testify of this gospel of the grace of God. Verse number 25. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Guys, this is the last time. This is the last time we're going to be together. I won't be heading back to Ephesus. I won't be there again. Paul apparently had great insight to the fact that he's not going to be free to travel in this part of the world again. 
And so he said, there's some things that you need to know because it's the last time I'm going to be with you. You know, this, this idea of the last time and imparting the, the final things that you need to hear was not something that Paul just came up with by himself. The Lord Jesus Christ did it the night before he went to the cross. And he gathered his disciples together. And we have chapters, multiple chapters of what he told his disciples that they needed to know because he was never going to be with them again in the same way. And Paul said here, the places where I've been preaching the kingdom of God, whether it was with you in Ephesus or whether it was in Philippi or whether it was in Corinth, I'm not going to be there anymore. We're, that you've, you've got to, one, know these things, and two, be able to stand on your own as we continue on. Verse 26, Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He says, Because I have told you everything that God wanted you to know, because if God has said something in his word, I preached it. Because if I understood something about Christ that was given to me, I've given it to you. I am free from the blood of all men. Meaning that there was some possible guilt that could be associated with a preacher or, or a believer in general if they knew the things of God and did not openly proclaim all of them. Paul said, if I had held back, if I had been unwilling to preach the gospel at times when it got me in trouble, if I had been unwilling to preach the whole truth, even if the truth, whole truth got me in trouble, I could have been accused of being guilty of the blood of some men, meaning that if they had died in their sins because I had kept my mouth shut, or if they had died trusting in the wrong thing because I was unwilling to preach a gospel of grace that brought a lot of flack from the people that said, you're being blasphemous against the law of Moses. If I had held back anything that God wanted me to hold, wanted me to give forth, then perhaps some guilt could have been put on my account and there would be blood on my hands because as the preacher of the gospel, as his ministry is to testify of this gospel of grace, if he hadn't given it, then those people could perhaps one day say, Paul, you could have, but you didn't. But he says, you know that I declared unto you the entire counsel of God. I preached and I taught all of these things and because of that, I'm pure from the blood of all men. Verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. He says, I've done this, but now you need to do this. If you all are the elders, if you are the overseers, if you're all the, the bishops or the pastors over these churches and these congregations that you take care of in Ephesus and the surrounding area, if that's your role, now you need to hold forth the word of God. You need to preach the Bible. You need to preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and not get caught up in lesser things or preach a lesser message. He says, and take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. He uses this language here that reminds us of a shepherd with his sheep. He talks about the flock. Shepherds would be out there moving their flock where they needed to be across the landscape, helping them to find water, helping them to find green grass so that they could grow healthy and that their coats would grow. That was his job, was to tend and to care for them and to help Keep them safe. And he says, you need, therefore, to watch out for yourselves that you stay in the truth and that you preach the truth and watch over the flock that God has given you as a shepherd. And really, it's the Holy Ghost who's made you an overseer. I cannot call anybody to be a preacher. Parents, grandparents, you can't call anybody to be a preacher. It's the Holy Ghost that gives that charge of the one who does it. Now, the church can recognize it. The church can encourage and the church can pray for, and the church can equip, and can enlist people that have already been called. But these people were called of God to be overseers of what? The church of God. And they were being told to feed the church of God. You say, they're supposed to have like a food program? Remember the context about giving the whole counsel of God, about giving out the gospel of grace to people. When he says to feed the flock, he's talking about preaching. He's talking about teaching. He's talking about giving out the word of God. And by the way, overseer, it's not your church. It's the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, meaning it's precious to him. And he was willing to pay that price when Jesus went to the cross to die for our sins and shed his own blood as propitiation, as satisfaction, so that God would look at this great exchange that was made, our sin for Jesus' righteousness, and he would stamp on that invoice in heaven paid in full. And so this is not some earthly idea that people came up with, but a pattern from heaven that God has revealed 
and take these things seriously, he says to them in verse 29, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He's still keeping with this imagery of the shepherd and the sheep. He says, there's going to be wolves that come in. You know what wolves do to sheep? They eat them, right? They take whatever they want from them. That's what they do. They try and find them and, and he says, that's going to happen. People are going to come in attacking the church of God, trying to lure them away with sinful things or lure them away with false teaching from the outside and say, no, nah, you really don't have it right. What you need is to come over out here. And they won't spare the flock. They don't care what happens to the flock. You all are overseers. You're the shepherds. You have to care. But in your own selves, he says, there will be people that come from the inside. Yes, there will be people on the outside, but there will be people on the inside. And they will want to draw people after themselves. They'll want to be somebody. They'll want to make a name for themselves. Well, have you heard about this preacher or that preacher? He knows a little bit more. This is so uh, almost prophetic because one of the terrible heresies that would happen later on this century, in the first century, is that there would be these guys called the Gnostics that would teach this idea that they know some secret information about God and heaven and angels, and only if you become one of theirs can you really know the whole thing. First John deals with a lot of those things. Because they talk about all sorts of false teachings that go on with that. Paul said there's going to be some people that come up from within you as well, and they'll speak perverse things, twisted things. That's what the word perverse means, by the way. When something is perverted, it's taking something that was straight and bending it. Something that was straight and ruining it. Imagine a railroad track. By the way, railroad tracks are supposed to be relatively straight or on a very gentle curve. If they get bent like that, you're going to have a derailment. That's what the term perverted means. It's the twisting, like the twisting of a railroad when there's a derailment. And so when they're perverted, they're taking things that used to be straight and plain and true, and now they're teaching error because of it. He says that's not only something from the outside, but beware on the inside. Verse 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Remember my urgency. Remember the truth that you were given. Remember the warnings that I gave you against bad doctrine, bad teaching. You say, is bad teaching really that big of a deal? Does, does, does that matter all that much? And I would say there is no greater thoughts than anyone thinks than their thoughts about God. And nothing that determines the way that they will live their lives and their vision of God. And we understand who God is by the teaching and preaching of God's word. And when people come and seek to make merchandise of folks, they're going to lie to you about who God is and about who you are and what you're supposed to do and what he expects of you in order to get nickels and noses inside of the building, which is something that sadly still goes on today, people using religion to that end. And he says, so know that they're coming from outside and know that they're going to be rising up from within you and watch and be alert and remember the things that you have been told because he is leaving and he will not be back again. Therefore, watch and remember. And he says that he reminded them with tears, the sincere urgency that they listen. Verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Have you ever had to entrust someone to God? Have you ever had to entrust someone to God? He says, brethren, I commend you to God. I entrust you to him. Pastor Clarence Sexton was one of my pastors, and he told about a time when he, would, he started to travel as he became known as a, as a pastor that um, was great for preaching special meetings. And he would always feel bad leaving his wife, Evelyn, and his two sons, Matt and Shan, at home. And going away and he would pray oftentimes as the plane was taking off and he would pray something along the lines of lord take care of my family while i'm away and he said one of the times he did it it was like the spirit of god said right back to him who do you think takes care of him when you're here right what well, it's not you there's this there's this scary moment when we realize that the things and especially the people that matter the most to us we really can't control what happens in their lives we really can't protect them I'm starting to get glimpses of this as my kids get older. How many of you have had kids leave the house? Right? I hear stories. Um, I know parents that were like, you're 18, now get out of my house. 
I know parents like that. I had a buddy, his mom did that to him. She's like, I kept you alive for 18 years, you're done, out. But for the majority of people, that's not how parenting works. I found out you don't stop all of the fear of their failures, all of the desires for them to do well, all of the heartache when they're hurting, that that somehow doesn't immediately stop when they turn 18. That all of those, and you have even less control. And so you and I will probably never have men that we train in the ministry or ladies that we train in the ministry that we're never going to see again and that we have to entrust over to God that they'll continue on. But we all have people that we're going to have to entrust to God. That's one of the reasons why people, when they have a new baby, they come and they dedicate their baby at church. We don't baptize babies because baptism is the pattern of the scriptures teaches. It always happens after somebody is saved and babies aren't able to believe anything yet until they're aware of their sin and they're aware of the, the, the gospel understanding. They, they, can't, they can't yet do that, but people will come in a Baptist church and they will say, we want to dedicate our baby. What are they doing when they dedicate their baby? They're commending him to the Lord. They're commending her to the Lord. They're entrusting that this child belongs to the Lord. And to them for a short time, they get to keep him or her. But that if it's God that doesn't care for them, how are you going to do it? And he says, here's what it is. I commend you to God and I commend you to his word because they are enough to keep you. I commend you to God and I commend you to his word because they are enough to keep you. They're enough, it says, that will build you up. They're going to keep you growing. And they're going to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. You're going to have a great reward in heaven when you stay close to these things. At some point, we're going to have to trust God with the people that are most dear to us. At some point, we're going to get to that place. Some of us already have. I'm sure it was not easy. And sometimes we've entrusted them to God, but then things get ugly and we start to try and jump back in. And if we could take that burden back on ourselves as though we could fix it only to make ourselves miserable because it's got to be God. Either God is big enough to take care of these problems or we're all sunk. We have so much that we care about in this world and so little control over it. So much that we care about, so little control over it, that will either drive us crazy and fill us with anxiety and stress and fear because we've forgotten God. Or we'll realize how little control we have and we're like, oh, whew, it's not up to me. That feels good. I can trust God. I can trust God with these people that are dear to me, that he is going to work and that his word is enough. And so he does that with these preachers, knowing that God will help them along. They, they had three years with Paul, but they didn't have anything like what we have today in seminary and Bible college and all of that. Uh, what they were learning was probably much more foundational and, and grounded in, in some ways, though much nearer to the times of Christ. So there was a vividness there. But even with what they have, he said, God is enough and the word is enough. And he says, I entrust you. Verse 33, I've coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. He says, by the way, when you remember my example, remember I didn't do this for the money. I wasn't in this trying to make cash. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. He says, I have worked. I have worked. When I didn't have money, I didn't sit there mooching off of everybody inside of the church. I worked. And I even provided for the missionary team that was with me. We didn't want to be a burden on you. So you know, he says, I wasn't in this for the money. He says, verse 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So don't end up becoming the kind of preacher that tries to charge four installments of $29.99 and you get some prayer towel that's going to, increase what God is going to give you in your paycheck, right? You need to, to give money to spread the gospel all over the world. And by give money to spread the gospel all over the world, I mean I need a $55 million private jet. He said, you're not going to end up like one of those people. You're going to end up like what the Lord Jesus said, where instead of getting, it's about giving. And as a preacher, you're not in this for the money. He wasn't in it for the money. He says, labor to support them that need things. Verse 36, and when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. What a precious time that prayer meeting must have been. How wonderful that must have been for them to have that one last time. And how many days, months, years into the future they'd say, do you remember when we went to Miletus and met with Paul? Do you remember the things he told us? Oh yeah, he was right about the wolves, wasn't he? Oh yeah, he was right. He was right about the people from inside. Do you remember so-and-so? Oh yeah, I remember that. But do you remember what he prayed for us? Remember when we prayed together? 
In the very next verse it says, And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. You know, when people leave, this is what it ought to look like. If you ever leave the church and the people are happy to see you go, something's wrong. And if you're ever happy to see them go, something's wrong, right? It ought to be sweet. It ought to be bittersweet when something like that happens. And that's what it was like. They weren't like, whew, Paul is finally gone. And Paul wasn't like, those bums. I was hoping they all wouldn't show up to this pastor's conference, but they came. No, there was a sweetness. And they, they wept, and they hugged each other, and they kissed each other. The, the thankfulness of the man that invested in them was evident. Verse 38, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should no more see his fa- that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. You know what they were sorry about the most is that they wouldn't get to be with him anymore. They wouldn't get to see him. They wouldn't get to spend time with him. Maybe the, the people that would come to Christ and his powerful preaching and all of that, perhaps, but it, it was him that they were going to miss. And there's something very accurate about that. Not just what they could get out of Paul or what Paul could do for their churches, but Paul himself. You see, it's easy to take the idea of St. Paul and to look at how God used him and all the books of the Bible that God used him to write and to kind of put him up here as somebody who's this untouchable paragon of faith. But then you see these moments like this and you say, I, I can somewhat understand what they're going through, what it must have been like for them to hug and weep together. How do we take away something from this passage when it's really far out of what you and I will probably experience directly? But first of all, let's follow God's leading. Let's follow God's leading. Paul knew he was headed to Jerusalem. The Spirit of God was clear that he had to go. He did not know the exact details, but he knew it would be rough. And yet none of these things made him get off the road to Jerusalem. None of these things made him change and say, you know what, I could go back up to Ephesus or up to even further to Philippi, and I could have a really good ministry for several more years where I wouldn't maybe end up in so much trouble with the Jewish government. And it might be easier for me to avoid Jerusalem because it's going to be so messy I know that's what God wants, and I'll get around to it eventually, but before I get there and this season of life ends, I'm going to try and hold on a little bit longer. He was surrendered. That was not his thought. He was surrendered to what it is that God had called him to do because Paul delighted in doing God's will. He says, I want to finish my course in joy. He said, it is a joy to me to finish my course, even if that means that I lose my life doing it. More than his freedom, more than his own comfort, more than his own life, His obedience to his calling and his love for his Savior moved him forward. What does God have for you? What does God have for you? Find out and then don't let God, don't let anybody get in the way of what God has called you to do. Don't let any of those things move you regardless of how hard it might seem. Now, Paul seemed to have a grand thing set and said, oh, he's going to Jerusalem, and then he's going to be arrested, and then he's going to have to defend himself, and there's going to be trials, and he's going to appeal to Caesar, and then he's going to end up in Rome, and maybe he gets out of Rome for a little while and goes to Spain and then back to Rome and all sorts of stuff. These ideas, uh, it's this grand thing. You say, I'm probably not going on a fourth missionary journey, Pastor. So do I have something that God wants me to do? And the answer to all of us is yes. There is something that God has for you to do. Let's go back to what we said. Do you have a family? Do you have a role in that family? That's something God has given you to do. Don't let anything get in the way of you being the father, the mother, the husband or the wife, the son or daughter. Don't let anything get in the way of those things that God has called you to do. Has God given you a career? Has God given you a passion? Has God given you ministry or an aspect of ministry? Some of you may, may be surprised at this, but, but those things don't always go smoothly, right? Some of you say, I've never had any problems, Pastor. I don't know what you're talking about. But for the rest of us, there are hard days in all of those things. Even in the best job or even in the most wonderful ministry, there are hard days. And you will want to quit. And some days it seems like there's no pathway forward. But if that's what God has put in your heart to do, then don't give up. Follow God's leading. Consider what passion and proficiency God has given you and then do that thing without stopping or slowing down because of hardship. Second of all, teach the whole counsel of God. Paul charges these leaders as shepherds to feed their flocks. The flocks or the church, they belong to God. They're precious to God. How are they supposed to feed it? Well, to preach and teach the word of God, all of it. In fact, Paul is so so strong on how we have to preach 
all of the truth of God's word, that he felt that there would be some guilt on him, that men's hands, or the men's blood would be on his hands, that he would bear guilt before God if he refused to do those things. And so whether it's publicly in church or privately in small groups or Bible studies or discipleship, every believer, by the way, should be able to disciple another believer, meaning that you should be able to take the things, the foundational things, the truths of God's word in the Christian life and impart it to somebody else. How would you feel if I called you up after uh, church tonight? And I said, by the way, there's a new person that's been coming to our church. They'd love to learn how to live the Christian life. I want you to spend the next 13 weeks meeting with them weekly and teaching them how to live the Christian life, right? I don't want you to raise your hands, but how many of you might be a little hesitant to do that? You might be like, Eesh, I don't know if I have what it takes. I don't know if I know all those things. And if you don't know those things, Get with somebody that does over the next 13 weeks and figure out how to help ground somebody in the things of God. Everybody ought to be able to do that. When I say teach the whole counsel of God or preach it, we might say, well, I'm not a preacher and I'm not a teacher. Then be a member of a church where they teach and preach the whole counsel of God. And encourage your preacher and your teachers to keep preaching the Bible. Lastly, entrust people to God. Entrust people to God. Paul entrusts his friends and these protégés, people that he's taught, to the Lord. He delivers them over to God and God's word because he knows that he can't be with them through every problem that they have. He, he's not going to be there anymore. He might be able to write them, but even in this day and age, mail is slow and difficult and things got lost. He can no longer care for them in person. Paul's message to us is God and his word are enough. You can trust God and his word and trust people to those things, and he will continue to work. We mentioned that we'll, we'll, we'll most likely never be in this situation in Miletus where you're speaking to all the pastors that you've trained. However, you're going to have to do this with your loved ones. And so there's probably somebody that your heart aches over or that you have fears and worries over and anxiety over in your life, and you're probably really worried about, well, what can I do in order to try and help them, and, and how do I need to, to give them this or that, and... And I'm not saying we don't have an active part to play, but at some point we'll realize that if their life is ever going to change, it's going to have to be God that changes it. And if they're ever going to stay with the stuff and not get caught off in bad doctrine or worldliness, then it's going to have to be God that does it. And if they're ever going to grow and they're ever going to become what God wants them to be, then we need to trust that God and his word are going to be enough for them to do that. The preaching of it in whatever church that they're at, hopefully, and trust that the prayers that we've given, and if it's children, the things that hopefully we put into their lives, that they're going to be all right. They're going to be all right. I, I'm terrified of facing this next season of life where my kids get older and out of the house without the Lord. I don't know how anybody would do it. Maybe they just, they just choose not to care anymore. I don't know how they'd do that. I'm, I don't have to be terrified because I have the Lord, but it's kind of a scary thought to think about they're going to go out there and hope, hopefully they're going to make it. But God is able. God is able and his word is enough. So let's learn to entrust people to them. It's hard to take your hands off, but we'll find that there's great peace on the other side once we've entrusted people to God. A couple of questions that we'll go over very briefly as we head towards prayer time. How did you find out what God wanted you to do with your life? How did you find out what God wanted you to do with your life? And you know what? It's different in every season, isn't it? God wanted Paul in Ephesus for those three years, but before that, he wanted him in Philippi, and before that, he wanted him in Corinth, and there was all sorts of times when he moved around. So, but was there ever a time when there was a season you knew you were doing what God wanted you to do? How, how did you find that out? I think some people would like to know. Sean? Okay, those are great things. What has God providentially done in opening or closing doors? And then where has God planted you now? Serve him right where you are. Yeah, that's good. Tony? He works on your heart. So he puts desires in there. He does. He does. Anybody else? Pastor Steve? This is a little bit different because it was ministry, but uh, and I, I was already pursuing a career and happy with my career. Specifically, 
pray, fasted, asked an increasingly wider group of people to pray with us, asked God to confirm what he was doing in his word, and um, continually, on a daily basis, acknowledged my surrender to him, saying, Lord, you're my master, you own me. If you want to change my orders, I say yes to whatever that is. Keep doing what I'm doing or doing something different. So those are very specific things. And that was a period of eight months, nine months, ten months before we really were certain there. So it wasn't a quick thing, but we just kept doing that over and over and over again until we were certain. Amen. It's good advice. Chris? Amen. That's good. This is a totally self-serving question. How can you encourage your preacher or teachers to keep preaching the Bible? To Tony? Keep showing up. Keep showing up. <laughs> Amen to that. I'll preach to an empty room. My wife knows I've done it. But it's a lot more fun when you're here. Amen to that. Ben? Tell him. It's good. I was going to say the same thing. Tell him. Tell him. You're doing good. Keep going. Amen. Yes, Chris? Keep preaching, Pastor. Amen. He did it right here. <laughs> He's like, not right now because it's after eight, but like next time we meet. No. <laughs> That's good. Amen. You know, there is, there is a temptation to change things when we don't see things happening as quickly as we want to. I think that's true in many areas, but in ministry, there's a temptation to change things. But I've never seen anything other than the systematic teaching and preaching of God's word build strong Christians. I've just never seen that. And um, I think it's the, the foundation of it. So I'm not, you, I'm not, you don't have to worry, but that thought, and so you may, you may have a Bible teacher in your life, maybe in a small group Bible teaching Sunday school class, something like that, where they need encouragement to stay on the Bible. And have you ever had to entrust somebody to God? Anyone have a story about that? Anyone want to share a story about that? Yeah, Roxana? Amen. And trusting a child. Anybody else? I'm just going to say, similar with my son, when he left home and we knew he was leaving home for good, that he would never be back in the nest. Um, and then when he, in the position he had in the Air Force, he was, he was deployed six times, seven times, something like that. But he was deployed uh, at least six of the, six of the, if there were seven, six of the times in a combat situation where he was seeing, even if it was an airplane, he was still seeing, I mean, real combat almost nightly. And, uh, you know, ISIS was pretty well equipped and, and uh, you know, you couldn't take any one of those 
enemies for granted because they were the real deal. And, and uh, you know, that's when they were, if they were capturing anybody, they were just doing horrendous, horrible, torturous things to them. And, and just to hear him talk about what would happen if you have to bail out if, you, if the airplane gets hit and, is just uh, unthinkable. And, and so at, at that point, what, what options do you have other than to say, Lord, he is yours. He's always been yours. We dedicated to him in this very building, him to you in this building, and um, you can protect him better than we can protect him. And, uh, so he just, and even now, you know, he flies several times a week, and it's like, Lord, mm -hmm. protect him. Amen. <laughs> yeah. By the way, it's not easy, right? God is faithful and his word is enough, but that doesn't mean that it's easy. Amen. Did you have your hand up, Brenda? I, yeah. Amen. Praise God. That's good. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are enough, and that your word is sufficient for all things. I pray that you'd help us to believe that, to live it in our own lives, that we would and trust ourselves to you that we would be in your word, but also to those that are around us. And I pray that you'd help us to follow where you lead, not letting anything get in our way, but that we'd stay faithful, even when it costs something. Help us to walk that road that you might be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. You did.